history here, uh, World War I, Romania joined on the side of the Triple Entente with the aim of regaining lost lands, um, different areas here, and then uh, the Treaty of Versailles and the Treaty of Trian in Romania officially became recognized. And this is Romania's borders today. The greatest migration came between 1895 and 1914. 85% of this were from three specific places. Um, it's really difficult to figure out how many actually came from this area because it was all part of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire and census records all list them from being one of those two areas. And it wasn't until later when the census records started using a mother tongue language requirement that you could find out more about where they were actually from in these areas. Uh, Romanians were a later group to emigrate. Um, the Transylvania Saxons were typically the first to leave in 18, by 1891. They had a settlement here in Cleveland, and that is now today still, they have that presence here as Saxonheim Hall. Um, and then we have solitary migration versus chain migration. The Italians came over in about the, in this period as well, and they were more of a chain migration type of thing where you would have a family member come over, then another family member, then another family. This with uh, Romanians is more of a solitary because there were such a diverse, different areas throughout the country. They would come over on their own and through well-known travel routes. Romanians in Cleveland, uh, 1902 is the first Romanian mutual benefit. Fit Society and Carpatina Hall still stands on West 58th Street. Uh, they had this settlement on the west side of the city in Detroit Avenue, Gordon Square area, uh, which was within an Irish settlement as well. Uh, First Romanian parishes in America are in this location as well. This area was known as Little Romania. You can see here. The Romanian Baptist Church was organized in 1910. It is one of the earliest of this denomination in the United States. The first was in Cincinnati. Uh, and we've given a brief history of how this church and this congregation came together over time. It grew and grew as more people came over. They got the land, but then World War I stopped the construction of the church. The architect is John H. Graham. Uh, he is a local Cleveland architect who designed buildings in the greater Cleveland area, including the Film Exchange building here, which is a designated landmark as well. Uh, with the completion of the church, uh, Fark was given his full-time status of missionary. He was ordained, and then he was called to go to Aurora, Illinois, and a new pastor that would be called uh, would be there for the next 35 years, Reverend Danila Pascu. Uh, he was unable to return to Romania because of the outbreak of World War II. He had been attending a conference in Atlanta. He was invited to become the pastor in 39. Uh, his wife and two children arrived in Cleveland in 1941. Um, after World War II, he became deeply involved with the immigration of people and is his reports that were influential in creating special funding for the Baptist World Alliance report. He was called before Senate for the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965, and it was his, the Congress, that put this together, and um, that family integration should be a top priority, so bring everybody, probably from his past experience with bringing his own family back as well. It should also be noted that another notable church member was Pascu's son, Dr. Dan Pascu, who was an astronomer at the United States Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C. And while he has many achievements in his career, his credit as a co-discoverer of the 14th moon of Saturn, Calypso, in 1980, stands out. So we talk about the uh, many moving parts in the leadership of Romania in the decade before World War II. Um, it was a military dictatorship, um, and then King Michael was the king at this time. Uh, he participated in a coup, which is believed that historians believe that this coup actually helped shorten World War II. So they had entered under, uh, aligned with the Nazis, and then that coup went over to the Allies. And it was interesting parts of this. 
1945, he was forced to appoint a pro-Soviet government leader uh, because uh, Romania became part of the Soviet Union via the Yalta Agreement, <clears throat> although it would distance itself from Moscow after Joseph Stalin's death in 1953. He was forced to abdicate the throne and sent into exile and had his properties confiscated. Uh, Romania would become a communist dictatorship until 1989. During his exile, King Michael visited the church uh, here we have uh, scenes from that and translated. It says, King Michael, King Michael in the church in Cleveland promises verbally and in writing, citing his commitment on the Bible from the pulpit of the church, that he will grant religious freedom to the Baptist believers in Romania if he returns to the throne in Romania. Congregation grew. It stayed into this neighborhood very late. Um, into the 1980s, as a matter of fact. And they finally moved out to the new facility in Parma in 1990. Um, it was sold to Zion Pentecostal Church in 1989. It was transferred in 1996 to an LLC, to another LLC in 2009. And about two weeks ago, it has new owners. Uh, we contacted uh, the staff, staff contacted the owner at the time of the nomination and because he was in the process of selling the property, we did not have um, permission in writing, but we did have a public hearing on July 2nd and new ownership of the property as of November 14th, 2022. The building meets criteria for landmark designation, age, integrity, and significance. We have a couple of pictures of the exterior. We're not able to get inside it but uh, it checks off basically every box that we have, just about every box that we have in our significance category. And I uh, need to thank Hel Lazar and David Jerka for their assistance in the research for this property. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Carl, thank you so much for your uh, detailed presentation as uh, usual. Um, Madam Chair, we will open it up to public comment. I believe we have a Corey es Eskin? I should. I should? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Corey? So uh, I'm Corey Aisha. I'm with Forest City Restoration LLC. We just bought the uh, church in the last two weeks and uh, really working or looking forward to working with the city and we agree with uh, moving forward with this. All right, because I was going to ask uh, whether you at all got in touch with the uh, property owners. And so, uh, yes. uh, Mr. Aisha, <laughs> Mr. Aisha is, is here. Um, and thank you for your, for your comments. Uh, Madam Clerk, that's the only person we have signed in for 867. Is anyone else? Has anyone else come in? Thank you, Madam Clerk. The public comment portion of the meeting is now closed. We'll open it up to the committee for questions. Committee. Councilwoman Spencer. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Of course, I want to make a few comments, um, seeing as though this is uh, located in Ward 15. And I was uh, very pleased that my staff member, Heather Lazar, could, could provide some support with the research process. Um, through the chair, Carl, would you mind returning just to the aerial image just for a quick moment, the kind of that Google Earth? I know it was towards the beginning. There you go. I just want to make a brief comment that the reason this is um, especially significant for me is if you, can, if you all see Detroit Avenue there, Detroit Avenue is a landmark district and those structures are protected. This particular property is one parcel outside of the historic district so it would not be protected from demolition. So this was really a process just to ensure that any future owner would recognize the historic significance. There has been a lot of um, desire to acquire and demolish properties in Ward 15, uh, and the community expressed a strong desire to see it preserved. And little did we know that all of this rich history <laughs> lay, lay awaiting uh, for, for all this research that was, that was brought forward. Um, and through the chair to Carl, I believe um, Mr. Jerka will be at council on Monday evening, potentially this coming Monday, if, if council passes this today. I will ask him. He was not able to be here today because they had other commitments. So. No problem, yes. but I'll follow up with him. Um, but nonetheless, I, I'm fully supportive of this, and it's, it's terrific to meet uh, Corey and the other new owners today and look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Spencer. Any further questions from the committee? Go ahead, Councilwoman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just curious to know, are you Romanian? 
I am not. Through the chair. Oh, okay. So I just have to share just a, a little story. So I had no idea about this rich history. So I was born on 54th off of Bridge. So I went to Joseph M. Gallagher. And I remember walking down full, uh, Franklin Avenue and... There were so many families, Romanian families that owned their home. And I loved it because they, they had that arch, like that berry arch in front of their home. So we would eat their berries. But now I understand why there were so many Romanian um, students in Joseph M. Gallagher. So thank you for this, um, this history um, and congratulations. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, so now we know who folks were talking about <laughs> when they came out and their berries were gone on that tree. All right. Statue of limitations, they can't do it, they can't touch it. All right. Uh, thank you, Councilwoman. Any further questions? Seeing no further questions, ordinance number 867 2022 stands approved. Thank you, Brother Carl. Thank you, Mr. Eisen. 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 All right. Thank you, sir. All right. Here you go. You want to grab it? Okay. Come on up, Mrs. Leonard. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to bring a guest today. Uh, you're not by yourself today? Just not today. Okay. I guess we all need some backup at some time. <laughs> at some point, rather. Sometimes. Shannon can right. handle herself. I heard, I heard that. Thank yes, you. sir. Yes, sir. Is there a dedicated person right now? Because you transitioned. Are you the. I'm still doing it. He's wearing many yeah. hats, which is why he's here. Okay. Really Maybe not well enough, but we can talk. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. You, you want to bring your other guests up too? I know he. Yeah, he's Xavier's just learning. David's still learning. Yep, he's learning. Should David sit at the table? If you want him to, you can. David, David, come on up here. Come on, David. Come on, Xavier. Get used to it, David. In Xavier. case you may have to be <laughs> up here one day. Xavier. 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 Did I say it sounded like so Xavier? Now who called him David? You called him David. You called David first. <laughs> Xavier, we apologize. No one called you David, and we all just said David. He gets a lot of names. In <laughs> Thank you. All right. Good morning. Good morning. So we will start with uh, Madam Clerk, ordinance number 956-2022 by Council Member Mara, and an ordinance changing the use area and height districts of parcels of land west of Pearl Road and north of Broadview Road, and adding an urban form overlay as identified on the attached map, map change number 2623. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Chair Shannon Leonard, Chief City Planner, yes. uh, Zoning. I'm going to turn over to uh, Mr. Matt Moss. He is the Near West Planner slash now taking on the new role of Manager of Strategic Initiatives uh, to walk you through this rezoning. Thank right. you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just as a point of history, too, and, and one reason why I wanted to be here today is we started a, a three-phase rezoning of this part of Old Brooklyn back in 2016. The first ordinance passed in November of 2017. The second one passed in November of 2018. And now we're here in November of 2022 gotcha. finishing it up. So I'm really pleased to be here to wrap this up, so to speak, with yes. and with the, the count, two council people representing Old Brooklyn as well. So thank you. Uh, I'll be as brief as possible. So like you stated, this is a, a, a map change to the zoning map in Old Brooklyn. This is our, our third phase. So the proposal here, again, is to change the underlying use area and height districts, as well as adding the urban form overlay. Uh, and this would realign it with the existing neighborhood fabric, promote development in line with the existing context, and uh, allow desired retail uses along Pearl Road uh, and Broadview Road, as well as zoning some park space that's currently not zoned as, as open space recreation to open space recreation. So here's a map of the area. This, uh, the yellow area shows the, the areas which we are proposing to rezone. Uh, the underlying red outlines and red lettering detail the existing zoning in place. So you can see what exists currently. And then uh, this map represents what we're proposing to change it to. So I'll go over each area in detail just to, to zoom in for you to make this a little easier to understand. So starting off at the intersection of, of Pearl and Broadview, uh, this is the existing context. You can see it's a lot of historic uh, retail. Uh, you have the typical retail ground floor, office perhaps residential above, that typical format. There's some newer retail with the Burger King closer or further up uh, north of, on Pearl Road. Uh, we're proposing to rezone this area to be a, a contiguous local retail G2 with the urban form overlay. And again, this matches the other two phases that have been done. And so this would bring it in line with the existing zoning that currently exists as of the previous two map changes I mentioned. 
here's the context of the street. So again, what this zoning uh, change would allow is, is pretty much permit much of the buildings you see currently in the context to continue to exist if permits were required for them to make alterations or renovations or to restore these buildings if they're damaged, for example, this zoning would allow them to do that and it would permit where there is vacancy for new, uh, new buildings to, to meet this context. Next, I'll go to the north to the, some of the park space. So this is uh, an existing city park to the north on the other side of Big Creek, that valley that you see there, and then also the newly uh, completed Brighton Park, a, a Metro Parks project in partnership with the Western Reserve Land Conservancy. So here's an aerial showing these areas. Uh, the aerial to the, for the south, southern parcel is a little old. That, that space has been renovated. The go-kart track is gone and is now a, a beautiful park space. And so what we're proposing to rezone this to is open space recreation. Yeah, we'll, we'll get that updated for sure. Uh, I think if you use a, the county GIS, it's updated. So yeah, for now it's, it's actually, this is more accurate too, showing, showing this aerial. You can see some of the pathways that have been installed. Uh, and, and since then, trees have been planted. So again, this is rezoning park space to be park space. Next, uh, there's some industrial space in here that we wanted to, to clean up, so to speak. And so essentially, uh, these are some existing light industrial uses. There are warehouses, there are, um, some uh, contractor shops, things like that. People use this space to store vehicles and store equipment. And so rezoning it to, it's currently semi-industry, but tightening up those boundaries and, and focusing it into this area just permits these uses to continue unimpeded. But should they be redeveloped in some way, this allows that flexibility as well. And so here's an aerial just showing those, that existing semi-industry. Next, we'll slide over to this area. Uh, just to refresh your memory briefly, this area right now is currently all zoned multifamily, but looking closer at the context on the uh, western side, which is the, the space outlined in red, we see more multifamily apartment buildings, small scale, you know, something in the 35 to 40 foot range, but some townhomes as well. But on the east side, you have single family and duplexes. And so essentially what this rezoning would do would designate the multifamily homes to be multifamily and the one and two family homes to be two family. So here you can see that here, like it's slightly a little denser on the left, a little lower density on the right. Essentially, this is just aligning the zoning with what's there. And here's a close-up of that as well. And so now the, the last two portions, we're looking at Broadview Road to the north as well. And so we have two different zoning proposals here. We have limited retail and then local retail. So in this section, closer to Pro Road, we proposed a limited retail district with a, two, with a urban form overlay. You can see from the context, there's a variety of buildings here. You have some traditional retail buildings with, that might have been uh, added on to, for example, an existing home over the, over the decades. But you also have some larger scale uh, uh, retail buildings, exclusive retail buildings, and some mixed use buildings. So buildings that have office or residential, as well as retail. And so the limited retail designation allows some greater flexibility in terms of what those uses could be that local retail doesn't. Local retail is really specific to, to more, more walking-based businesses. Sure. And the building or to the far left at the corner. Sure. Why is that building left out? Why did you designate that differently than the rest of the strip? Yeah. So the, the building on the corner, we put that in the context of the local retail based on the, okay. the uses as it turns onto Pearl and mm -hmm. in that context. And going uh, now south on, on, on Broadview, having that limited retail because of the, just the physical nature of the buildings and the uses okay. that are currently in there are different. Okay, right. yeah. thank you. But there isn't too much of a distinction between local retail and limited retail. Local retail, really, there, there are a lot of uses we find um, that are only permitted in general retail, for example. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, we are seeing variances. Those users go, they, they look for, for spaces and, and buildings that meet their needs, but they're in local retail zoning and then require a variance because it's so limited in terms of what the uses are. And so we're trying to balance where we designate zoning that allows people to get a permit by right. Whereas where there are buildings of, of a more residential context, for example, keeping it local retail makes sense. Sure. So we're trying to, to really create areas where we right. can tell a business owner, look, like this is zoned appropriately. You should think about leasing this space. And that also signals to the property owners what type of, of tenants that they should probably lease to. It helps the CDC understand when they're marketing space to potential businesses where they can give them a smoother process in terms of getting a permit from the city of Cleveland. Sure. So it's all of those things. Okay, thank you. Sure. 
And so that's, that's this context. Again, there are some auto-oriented uses as well. So local retail prohibits uh, like auto garages and things like that. And some of those uses no, do exist in this area as well. And so that's another reason why we wanted it to be limited retail. And so again, here's a close-up of that context. And there's another zoomed in view. I'll get to the last portion here. Like I uh, said earlier, there are some homes in this space. There are some restaurants, some other, like I said, more of those businesses where you have a building that has a retail storefront, but then some apartments above, for example. Local retail just essentially permits all of the uses and forms you see currently in the context by right. What the urban, o urban overlay does is it helps alleviate um, the parking code in terms of the required amount of parking. You can see here that these sites are pretty small, and so uh, for the most part, it, it, it would allow them to be, to be renovated or to be occupied with greater ease and also would encourage uh, reduced curb cuts, and the, which also reduces conflicts with vehicles, making the streets safer. So that's another reason why we, we propose this for this context. And, and here's another, here's a shot of that. So for example, like this business would still be able to operate, but we might have them, you know, if, if they were to renovate or if a new building were to go here, for example, the curb cut would have to be off of the side street. So this is an area, I did choose this shot in particular too because this is an area where we have, have, we have a higher incidence of crashes that are reported through ODOT and you know, through neighbors as well. And so there are many ways in which we try to address that, but addressing the context is one tool we have. And so this is what we're, we're attempting to do today. And I believe, yeah, here's looking south, so same side of the street. And then I think that's it. All right, thank you for the uh, detailed presentation this morning. And we will now open it up for public comment. Madam Chair, we, Madam Clerk, we have one person, I believe, signed in for ordinance number 956, Mr. Anthony Duvall. Come on up. You sit there or there? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for that presentation. I believe you guys are from the old Brooklyn Development Council, so thank you for that. I hadn't seen that, but I did see a photo image of my particular building um, as a building um, owner in that area. Um, just wanted to see how this rezoning would affect me and my business uh, specifically. Um, I am the owner of um, Sticks and Stones, which is a cocktail cigar lounge. They're right next to KCC's catering service. I own the building there. Um, and just, again, wanted to find out um, with the rezoning, does that affect my business specifically? And if so, in what way? And where, where's, where's your building located? Uh, we're at 3314 Broadview Road. Um, I have the parcel, if that, if that better helps. So he's in limited retail, then he's fine. So you'd be in the... Okay. Go Mr. Ahead. Chair, can I clarify? Absolutely, yes, the, go ahead. The um, commenter, would you be located in this area? That's designated limited retail uh, in the yellow? Uh, we are in the limited retail uh, Got it. Uh, area there. And, and again, when we purchased the building back in 2019, um, there were a series of rezoning requirements and variances that were required, right. um, which we did satisfy through the city of Cleveland. So right. again, we, we did receive the notification. Um, it's just not being very privileged to what goes on with these zonings sure. and, and rezoning. So I just wanted to make sure I was here. Uh, just to speak on it and just to make sure uh, how that affects me in any way at all. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, I would clarify too, without knowing the specifics of the types of variances that you requested and were granted, what this rezoning is, is, would likely do is, is either eliminate most or all of the variances that you probably sought to, okay. to open your business. Okay, great. And so, great. unfortunately, you had to go through that process, and we're very <laughs> grateful that you did and that your business is open. But um, in the future, too, if you needed to, you know, if you wanted to do an addition to your building, for example, uh, the previous zoning would actually probably make that difficult and require you to seek gotcha. more variances. But gotcha. under this rezoning, it's likely, depending upon the extent and nature of your proposal, if you were to make one, for example, you would likely be able to do it by right without needing a variance. Okay, great, great. Yeah. Well, that's why I got up this morning and came into the council meeting. Yeah, and I can, we can connect too, and I can answer more Absolutely. specific questions. Thank you so if much. Like. I appreciate that. Sure. Great. Uh, great questions. Thank you, Mr. Duvall. Uh, we you. appreciate you, uh, you coming and offering your comment and asking the questions because that's important. You know, if you don't know, come yeah, and find you don't out, know, you right? Don't know. Absolutely. Don't just assume and then don't wait until you 
you try to do something else, and then you're like, wait a minute. Oh, yeah. this was this is what that was about. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely not. So thank you for your Thank uh, you for having comments. me. I appreciate right. that. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And uh, as Mr. Moss said, he'll connect with you uh, just to talk about any, any other specifics that you may have around the zoning itself. All right? Great, great. Thank you guys for the time. All right. Thank you. Madam Clerk, do we have anyone else sign in for public comment on this piece? All right. We'll now close the public comment portion of the meeting. We'll open up the committee for questions. Councilwoman Mara. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Mr. Duvall, before you leave, I want to introduce him. Okay. <laughs> um, I just want to say that this process has been a long time in the making, um, almost since we were, I was uh, sworn in, myself and Councilman Harsh uh, met with City Planning as well as Old Brooklyn Community Development Corporation to go over this. Uh, very much supported in terms of the end of a multi-step process to improve zoning in, in the Old Brooklyn uh, corridor around Pearl and Broadview and State. Um, and particularly think it's a great example of the urban form overlay process and how we can better utilize that um, throughout the city. So this has my full support. I know that um, uh, Matt has gone, uh, has really gone above and beyond to make sure that business owners are notified. We sent out notices to everybody who was affected, had some open hours at Old Brooklyn CDC to talk to folks about it. Um, and I have not had any concerns from uh, neighbors or from the community. So this has my full support going forward. All right, thank you, uh, Councilwoman Mara. Uh, any other further questions from the committee? Councilman Harsh. No, nope, after you. Go ahead. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just want to say because um, I represent what's not, <clears throat> you know, everything that's white and that just about. Uh, we did meet with, uh, with uh, Planner Mount Moss earlier this year, and it's nice to see all of Old Brooklyn finally get unified because this was the sort of the last piece missing from the what I call the downtown Old Brooklyn corridor. Um, it's good to see the whole thing come together and all the planning. I think I think this actually finishes up the the project, if I if I recall. We're we're kind of all set after this. Maybe through the chair. <laughs> yes, I'd say until you know, we find another need to address. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, then I think it's a good time, uh, Mr. Chairman, to remind all of our business owners that when we do stuff like this, um, current use is grandfathered. So people are allowed to continue their businesses as they exist. And that grandfather exists so long as that use is maintained. Can I get, can I get an amen or, or, or a yes on that? Mrs. Leonard? Yep, through the chair to the councilman. Uh, yes, generally, if it is uh, a legally existing use, meaning they have a legal certificate of occupancy on file, that use is grandfathered in. Because I know that there is a person back there that paints cars, and I remember a couple years ago they got their variants to get their business up, and they paint cars in the back. They're allowed to keep doing that as long as they remain open. And should they sell that business, they could sell that business with the same use as long as it doesn't close for more than six months in between. Correct. Or two up oh, through the chair to the councilman, or two years remove any like sign of uh, painting cars. Of activity, of use of the variance. Yes. Got it. I think it's always important to let our business owners know that they're, 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 they can continue doing their business. Nothing changes for them so long as they are in operation. They are totally fine. They are grandfathered in. So I just want to get that out there. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Harsh. Any other questions from the committee before we go? Do we have, I know we have some amendments. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair. Questions? No? Yes. Just an amendment. All right, Councilwoman. So here's an amendment, pretty long to read, but I will start. It says, there is no legal objection to this legislation if amended as follows. Number one, in the title line three, strike west and insert east. Is our attorney taking that information? Or they do, they, have do they already have it? Okay. Yep. Um, two in section one, line two, strike of wildlife way and insert of the center line of wildlife way and the center line of. Got that? Okay. Three in section one at the end, strike the last two bold lines and in section two, strike the first line all in their entirety and insert and. Got that? Okay. Four, renumber existing section three to new section two. Number five, an, exist, an existing section three, line nine, after thence, strike westerly and insert northwesterly. Number six, an existing section three, at the end, strike the last two bold lines, and in existing section four, strike the first line all in their entirety and insert and. Number seven, 
Renumber existing sections 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 to new section 3, section 4, section 5, section 6, section 7, section 8, section 9, and section 10. 8 and existing section 10, last line strike districts and insert district without an S. 9 and existing section 11, line 1, strike 1 through 9 and insert 1 through 8. And last but not least, strike the existing map and insert the following new one. And here's the picture. Thank you, Councilwoman, Thank for you. the uh, uh, motion. Do I have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? See no discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? All right, ayes have it. Thank you, Councilwoman, Thank you. for that very, That's very brutal. long no. amendment. I so can make a comment on that. Whoever wrote this one up, you know. <laughs> Uh, it was, actually, it was, it was two people. It okay. Was when I was on my hiatus. All right. So I apologize. Okay. All right. So we Couldn't got get this right all now. together. Uh, thank you. Uh, any further questions from uh, the department? No. No further questions. Uh, ordinance number 956 2022, as amended, stands approved. Thank you all so much. Councilman? Mr. Thank Chair, you. may I have a miscellaneous with the zoning team before they leave? Yes, we have two more pieces. Great, just before right. they leave. Thank you. All right, sounds Mr. good. Thank you. Also with the joining team. All right, here you go. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to, Madam Clerk, ordinance number 1017 2022 by Council Member McCormick, an ordinance to supplement the codified ordinances of the Cleveland, Ohio, 1976 by enacting new section 357.071 relating to yards and courts. Yep. All right, Mrs. Leonard. Uh, good morning, Shannon Leonard, Chief Zoning Planner, City Planning Commission. Um, so this proposal is really not a rezoning. We're actually just adding a tool to the zoning code. Um, the purpose is to support and protect the Cuyahoga County River I mean, excuse me, Cuyahoga River, and other water courses by enhancing water quality and supporting stormwater management, and to protect the health and safety of water courses so they can continue to contribute meaningfully to all Clevelanders through commerce, recreation, and general well-being. And so currently, uh, you may be familiar with yards. Uh, that's what we also refer to as setbacks. We generally have uh, front yard setbacks for all residential districts and local retail districts, as well as all residential units. Uh, we have side yard setbacks for all dwelling units. We have side street yard setbacks for all residential districts and local retail districts. And we have rear yard setbacks required for all residential districts and residential units. And then we also have what a lot of you may be familiar with previously is specific map setbacks. And so those are front yard setbacks that take uh, precedence in all districts. And then we also have a, an environmental type of setback, which is repairing and wetland setbacks. Uh oh. And so uh, just to give some context for what we're proposing today, um, there was a rezoning a few uh, about a year ago uh, along the Cuyahoga, County, uh, Cuyahoga River. Um, there was also the Vision for the Valley project uh, that really lent its way to really uh, trying to find a tool as a way to connect um, the riverfront with the public. Um, and so this is where we uh, started thinking about how could we work with the business owners um, along the river um, and the residents and uh, you know, move forward. And so again, this is just a quick uh, illustration of what residential yard setbacks are. Uh, they're required uh, generally for all residents in all residential districts. Uh, map setbacks are those specific setbacks that are already in our existing zoning code. It references their front yard setbacks from the street line, uh, street center line, or property line. Uh, they take precedence and they can only be changed with legislation. And so just to give you some current definitions because this is a new tool, uh, a building line means a line between which and the street line or lot line that no building or other structure can be a part of except as provided in the zoning code and it may be erected above grade level. The building line is considered a vertical sur surface intersecting the ground on such line. Uh, so that's really your front yard line. A setback building line is, means a building line back of the street line. So this term would not work for this new tool uh, since we are proposing to be set back from the river. Uh, the specific building line is a setback building line indicated and located on the building zone map. Um, so those are on the, uh, the historical linens also that you can find on our GIS. 
Uh, and then a yard is an open space on the same lot with a main building or structure extending between the lot line and the extreme front, rear, or side wall of the main building. So essentially anything from the building to the lot line. And so what we're proposing is the term watercourse building setback. And so this is a required yard space in which no structures may be located except where specifically allowed by the Cleveland Zoning Code. It is indicated on the building zone maps of city as from the property line of a lot abutting a watercourse. Uh, variances are possible. So for instance, front yard setbacks and specific map setbacks, you cannot get a variance. It has to be changed through legislation with the specific map setbacks. Uh, and this takes precedence over all other setback regulations in the rear yard. And so what we're proposing is adding the term watercourse building setback. What that is is a building line indicated on the building zone map along a watercourse as defined in 351.04 GGG shall be the building line for that water course. In other words, this, a structure has to be set back. Uh, when, when we map this type of setback, a building would have to sit behind that from the water course, from their lot line fronting a water course. Um, and so a water course is any natural, perennial, or intermittent lake, pond, channel, stream, river, creek, or brook with a defined bed or bank or shore. And so that term is already defined, and so we're not going to redefine it. And so why are we doing this? Uh, this is to promote equity and inclusion through greater access and connectivity while also protecting the health, safety, and welfare of all citizens of Cleveland by minimizing the encroachment on watercourse channels and the need for costly engineering solutions, by protecting structures and reducing property damage and threats to the safety of residents, and to contribute to the scenic beauty and environment of the city by preserving the character of the community, improving quality of life, and enhancing property values. And so that's what we're proposing, the water course building setback. This does not affect any property owners today, uh, but we have to have the tool uh, to map a setback along any lot that is abutting a water course. Um, and so we're just introducing the term into our definitions in the zoning code, uh, but we are not mapping anything today. If anything is mapped, we will come back before you and obviously the community um, going forward. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Uh, Mrs. Leonard, I was gonna ask you that. You know, uh, do you all intend to make any of those uh, map changes uh, at the moment? And if so, I'm, I'm certain that I will have to come back and you answer that question. To the chair, yes sir. So uh, the, the intention is after with the vision for the Valley and actually working here with Mr. Moss and his team, the initial proposal would be on properties north of 90 that are mostly either um, vacant and are up for new construction um, or they would work with the property owners directly. Um, we've been working with, I believe it's Flats Forward. Flats Ford, as well as the Vision for the Valley Coalition, as well as Councilman McCormick, to work with the property owners to get them kind of prepared for these next steps if we do add it. In addition to that, uh, the property owners would be able to seek a variance. Um, we wouldn't map the setback where, um, where there's existing structures like within that setback. Um, but if they did need a variance in the future, they would be able to still obtain that. They wouldn't have to, to go through a whole new legislative process. Sure. So if there's existing structures there, you would not require a, a, uh, a change if there's existing structures already uh, within that footprint. Yeah, I think the idea would be not to map a setback along that property if there's an existing structure there. Good. Um, so what, is, what does this do for places like um, the Alley Cat or, or I'm just thinking of places that sit close to the, uh, to the, to the, to the water there, uh, Alley Cat and Lindsay's Lake and, and come on McCormick, help me out. Um, those other- All the, the flats. Those other, right, it's, it, all of them, all of them. What, what does that do for, uh, for, for those uh, businesses and those, those, those living quarters there that, that lie in the waterfront? So I'm gonna turn this to Matt because him and his team have been doing like an analysis along the different properties around the riverfront of sure. where buildings are actually existing and how close they sit to their lot lines uh, fronting the river. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think that's a great example of uh, the Flats East Bank project specifically, including the businesses that you mentioned are, are part of that project. That's a project that the city was heavily involved in. Uh, and part of that project was building a public boardwalk along the river. And so what this tool let us do, for example, 
one of the uses of it is if we are working with either a developer or the city's working with a, uh, another partner to do to create uh, a public boardwalk or public waterfront access space, we can use this tool to map along other adjacent private properties where appropriate to make sure that if in the future that, that the investments or projects that are done following that investment, for example, or that kind of project, that we're maintaining a consistent setback from the river. And so that would allow us either to, to respect that investment that's been made in that context that we're creating through a project like that, and perhaps in the future, utilize more of that space in agreement with property owners to create, expand that boardwalk or create more public waterfront access. And so it's in part protecting um, the existing, a new context to our river valley, which is one of public access and, and, and public space along the river, which is, again, relatively new to our river valley. Uh, but it would also allow us to to plan for the future in terms of where buildings are located along the river. We have um, another issue we're working on too is just the maintenance and restoration of existing bulkheads. There's it's all artificial bulkhead for the most part along the river valley in a few places where it's been restored to a natural uh, river shore. Sure. And so this would let us plan for future investments. We we know the bulkhead bulkheads now are aging and require are starting to require maintenance or even replacement. And so having this tool now in our code would let us better plan for where new buildings are being built that we can then still maintain or access or, or to at a later point perhaps come in and replace that bulkhead or maybe naturalize it back to a natural shoreline. Sure. Thank you for that. And lastly, I'll turn over to the uh, committee. Um, you know, there's other parts of the riverfront that are uh, being considered for, for development as well, such as behind the uh, casino. Uh, Bedrock. You know, where, where Bedrock has I've been talking for a while about their plans to restore uh, some space that they that they have behind there. What does this do for a project like that? Does this is this in line? Does this support the ideas that they have shared? You know, with with folks um, about their potential plans there. Yeah. So to the chair, um, there's obviously the goal is um, as Matt had discussed was to allow public access to the riverfront that's something that the city of Cleveland has struggled with for years mm -hmm. is more access because we've fronted most of the river with industrial and so it's really working with bedrock and other industrial users and other users that do have property abutting the riverfront to map that setback uh, so that when they do bring in a new construction that and hopefully within a partnership so a public private partnership that they would create this boardwalk not just for their project, but for all of the citizens of Cleveland. So it really allows them greater access to the riverfront. Sure. Thank you. Yep. Uh, open it up to the committee for questions. Committee? Sure. Councilman McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, no need to add anything. Shannon did a great job um, overviewing this policy. I just wanted to voice my support for it. Um, the planning department um, has done a lot of work, Mr. Chair, on this policy in working with community partners. So I want to thank you all for that hard work and dedication. Um, and again, I think this is a really important tool and step um, for the city of Cleveland to ensure that uh, when and where uh, we utilize this tool that we are promoting public access. We're promoting uh, everybody in our community to have access to our natural resources. Um, that is a priority of, of I know, of mine and, and my ward. Um, and I know it's a priority of the city as a whole. Um, you know, our, all of our residents should be able to access our natural resources, hard stop. So um, again, a lot of conversations to go, but this is an important tool and a good first step um, to achieve that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council McCormick, Councilman Joe Jones. Mr. Chairman, I certainly echo um, the sentiments of my colleague, Mr. McCormick, as it relates to uh, access. Um, and also, I want to encourage uh, the zoning department to work with me in my neighborhood so that we can set up a similar type of uh, zoning on the east side of the city of Cleveland. Um, the residents are just in need as other parts of the city of Cleveland, but we haven't had those kind of investments. So I think, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I welcome the opportunity I, to sit down with the distinguished ladies, start talking about zoning plans in my neighborhood and how we can have access to um, our parks and our facilities and, and, and get the kind of investments that Eastsiders deserve to have in this city. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman Joe Jones. Any further questions from the committee? All right, seeing no further questions from the committee, I agree that you know whatever tool we can use to uh, help 
provide even greater access to the waterfront uh, and lakefront and uh, uh, pond front, whatever. All across the city, you know, um, always uh, in, are, you know, we're in support of making that happen. So thank you. Ordinance number 1017-2022 stands approved. All right. Thank you. Here you are. We have one more for the team. Ordinance number 1193-2022 by Council Member Griffin. An ordinance changing the use, height, and area districts of parcels of the land north of Cedar Avenue between East 107th Street and Stokes Boulevard and subjecting an area title titled the Site Development Boundary to Section 333.02 of the Cleveland Zoning Code and attaching the approved site development plan map change 2656. Good morning. Good morning. Shannon Leonard, Chief Zoning Planner for the City Planning Commission. Uh, so this is a site plan specific uh, rezoning. So this is a little bit different than just a typical map change. Um, site plan specific rezonings are generally for uh, one or two single parcels, a couple parcels uh, within a greater project. Um, and they have uh, certain conditions tied to them. So they're site plan specific. So they have to stick to the site plan. Uh, to allow the proposed development to move forward as planned, uh, this is also to promote a diver diversity in housing typologies and then also to support transit and alternative uh, mobility choices. And so this is the existing uh, condition south of Carnegie, north of Cedar, uh, between East 107th and Stokes is this large uh, parcel here. It's actually about five parcels, but they have consolidated it now uh, into one large parcel for this project to move before forward. Um, it is between several different meds and eds uh, institutions uh, in this area. Uh, and so the existing zoning here is local retail. Um, it's also there are some existing setbacks. So along the north side of Cedar, there is a 43-foot uh, specific map setback that is uh, existing uh, from the street center line. This is a historic um, setback that runs pretty much uh, east and west along Cedar. And then there's a five foot specific map set back from the property line along East 107th Street. And so what we're proposing to do here is uh, site plan specific. Uh, we are going to change the use from local retail to limited retail uh, and change the area district to H and then add a height limit of 115 feet, uh, which is already existing. Uh, we're just uh, moving it forward. And then we're also proposing a zero foot specific map setback from the property line along uh, Cedar and a seven foot specific map setback from the property line along Stokes. And so I'll just walk you through these. Uh, this is the site development boundary. This is where the proposed project is going forward that was approved by Planning Commission uh, a couple months ago. Uh, this is the site plan, just to give you an overview of what the site plan is that is attached to the legislation. It has to be uh, because they have, once they have building, when they pull the building permits, uh, they have to do so within 12 months or the uh, former zoning goes back to what it, it goes back to the former zoning. Uh, these are just some quick elevations so you can see the project that was approved by Planning Commission. Uh, here is uh, some renderings. Uh, again, this is for a multifamily structure along with townhouses. Uh, so they're proposing 255 apartment units. Um, they're proposing 66% fully furnished studio apartments, uh, which is 169 of the units. Uh, none of it will be short term, so they won't be renting out like Airbnb, things of that nature. Um, they're also proposing six townhome units, and then they're proposing 87 off-street parking spaces, which is generally 33% of what's typically required. Um, and so this project is why are we allowing them to do a site plan specific rezoning? Um, because they are proposing that many units and they're only uh, proposing 33% of parking uh, for several reasons. One, we understand the population that they are renting to. It is, since 66% is studio apartments that are fully furnished, that tells me you're renting to students in the area as well as medical professionals that may be here for, you know, a year, two years, et cetera. Um, and so you probably most likely may not have a car. Um, and so additionally, we required them to do uh, a, a parking demand study. Uh, they have made a, a written commitment, which is in the legislation, 
to Fairfax to work expeditiously with the city to create a residential permit parking uh, to preserve any type of residential street parking for current residents of the neighborhood uh, should residential street parking become an issue, um, which was one of uh, Council President Griffin and Fairfax's concern was, you know, if they end up needing more than 87 parking spaces, where will they park? Will they be parking along the residential streets to the south and to the north? Uh, and if so, then they will uh, commit to working with Fairfax and the city uh, to create a residential permit parking through um, transportation and engineering, and then our streets. And then also they are in close proximity to several bus routes, including the Health Line, which offers 15 minutes or better frequency. In addition to that, we required them to select a set of transit uh, demand management strategies. And so what is transit demand management? It is a set of strategies aimed at maximizing traveler choices. It focuses on understanding how people make their transportation decisions and helping people use infrastructure that is in place for transit, ride sharing, walking, biking, and other modes of active transportation. Uh, they were provided a list of choices that have been identified as highest priorities that offer the greatest amount of opportunity and benefit to the residents of the entire neighborhood and visitors alike. Uh, and then the current site plan specific legislation requires development, this development to adapt and maintain the prescriptive uh, TDM strategies throughout the course of um, all ownership. Uh, and so what are the required strategies? They will be exempt from the requirements of 340 -09. 34904, which is our parking requirements, as it relates to automobile parking, so long as the property owner continuously adopts and maintains the transit demand management strategies as adopted by Planning Commission and attached within that legislation. Uh, the transit options, they have made the legislative commitment to subsidize transit passes at 40% subsidy to tenants not eligible for free or discounted passes as students or employees through the Community Advantage Program offered by the surrounding meds and eds. Uh, residents will experience a cost saving if they opt not to rent a parking space. Uh, they will be providing electric car charging stations uh, for 10 parking spaces initially with infrastructure to expand to at least 50% of the parking spaces. And so the director of sustainability had some questions about how they were going to provide this type of uh, infrastructure. Uh, and the developer, Acre, has direct investment with electric charging firm to handle challenges, and they believe that the reduced parking will not cause any type of grid overload at the time. Uh, and so further, they will work with the city of Cleveland to reduce traffic lanes, improve crosswalks, and utilize other traffic calming features to enhance the pedestrian experience. Uh, they will make some street scrape improvements uh, to provide new sidewalks and landscaping surrounding the project site. The interior is secured with bike parking provided for 150 plus bikes and covered exterior bicycle parking will be provided for convenience. Uh, they will also be providing uh, bicycle repair kits, air pumps, and adequate workspace provided for all residents and staff. Uh, this is a shared bicycle program with locks, helmets, baskets, and other amenities. Uh, they will explore that option as an amenity. Uh, and then there will be designated parking available for shared electric scooters as an affordable, convenient, and carbon-free amenity. Uh, we do have the support of Council President uh, Griffin. And so that is the proposal. So we're proposing to change uh, to limited retail H3, adding that zero foot setback um, so that they can provide townhouses with an active use along Cedar to make Cedar a more uh, walker friendly um, street. And then also the zero foot, seven foot setback along Stokes uh, and then giving them exemption from the parking requirements so long as they uh, provide and maintain the TDM strategies listed within the uh, legislation. Thank you. All right. Thank you again, Mrs. Leonard, Mr. Moss, for a very detailed presentation. Uh, we will now open it up for public comment. Madam Clerk, there's no one signing on this list. Has anyone else uh, come in for public comment? All right. Thank you. We will now close the public portion comment of the uh, meeting. We'll open it up to committee for questions. Mr. Councilman Chris Harsh. Thank you. Through the chair, I just have a question about the transit demand management. I haven't heard about this before, so I'm curious. Um, what prevents them from just, you know, changing their mind after the building's built? I mean, if they decide not to do any of this, I mean, what's, what's, our, what's our recourse to hold them to this type of uh, agreement? 
through the chair to the councilman. So that's why we put it in the legislation so that they are required by law through council and the legislation to require those transit demand management strategies. The recourse is to require them to seek a parking variance uh, through the Board of Zoning Appeals. Um, and so they would have to provide the parking. There's really not a, this, you can't provide the, you know, follow through. But, but through the chair, this would be after the building's built. I mean, once the building's built, there's no more room to add parking. So if they build the building, and in a year after the building opens, they decide they don't want to participate in the transit demand management program anymore, we're not going to make them tear down the building. What, 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 what happens at that point? Through the chair to the councilman. So our d director of building and housing is committed to proper code enforcement. And I think that they could use their resources. And the law department could probably give you more um, information regarding like how they would enforce and fine and use fines to get them to comply or to go and seek up, uh, you know, to establish use for parking at a nearby location. We could potentially find them through the chair for mm -hmm. violating these agreements on a, I mean, yeah. I imagine a daily basis, I would suppose, if, yeah. if they fell out of compliance with, with the, uh, the transit demand management strategies. Sure. Yeah. That makes sense. And then through the chair to the councilman, uh, because of that same concern by uh, council president and Fairfax, that is why we Generally, when we exempt developments from parking uh, requirements in site plan specific rezonings, for instance, uh, the Electric Gardens project a few years ago, we exempted them from parking requirements. We didn't require any additional uh, transit demand management strategies or anything of that sort of ways to deal with if parking becomes an issue, right? Or how to deal with parking if we're going to uh, reduce parking minimums to zero and allowing the developer to build based on what they believe is demand uh, or the parking necessity for their projects. Uh, that we would, um, that's why we included in the legislation was really so that, really to kind of put teeth into the to requiring the developer to maintain and adopt those strategies. And then I can also, um, Matt, Mr. Moss is really pushing the transit demand management um, studies and initiatives within city planning, and he can answer additional questions uh, regarding that specifically if you have them. By all means, I, I have follow up, so go ahead. This gentleman here? Yeah. Go ahead, Councilor. Please, I, I, I'll have follow up, but go ahead. Sure. Uh, to the, to, through the chair to the councilman, um, overall, so broadly what you're seeing today is uh, site-specific rezoning to address a specific project. We saw an opportunity given the context of this project and uh, paralleling with some uh, ongoing planning work that we're doing uh, right now to look at projects that come in and ask for these types of relief from our zoning code, how they can better meet the context and offer uh, to support alternative modes of transportation. And so one reason why now it's, it's, it's in the map change is we don't have a lot of the legislative infrastructure in place yet to have a program that we, I think you might feel more comfortable in, in it being enforceable. And so what we're doing now is, is, is through this, is, is trying to pilot some of these solutions to see how palatable they are to developers and how feasible they are to accomplish through the development process. What we're working on now and what we hope to show uh, sometime in the, in the new year is how we might have a policy like this that might apply specifically in areas that are well served by transit. For example, the Health Line or Euclid Corridor uh, near fixed rail transit stations like the Red Line, the Blue Line, the Green Line, areas where we and or RTA have made significant investments into this type of infrastructure along with a way to enforce that on an ongoing annual basis, for example, with, with projects. Mm -hmm. And so what this developer has done is we've given them a draft menu of options to pick from, and they've picked what they need um, or, or they think is feasible and suitable given the location of their project and their means and information that is s specific to, to, to them, right? Um, but our goal would be to try to pilot a program going forward where we can offer these options for projects that are located near transit as a way to better manage the use of our transportation infrastructure, including roads, but also transit and, and bicycle infrastructure as well. So that's sort of the background of, of what we're exploring with this. This was an opportunity to pilot some of those options and I think meet some specific concerns and requests both of the community and of the councilman. Sure. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Because I understand there's a chicken and egg problem where we want density in the urban core, but we also have these parking requirements that actually kind of run contrary to our public transit goals and also take away a lot of developable land because parking lots take up a lot of 
acreage. Um, so I understand that this is an interesting way to try to address that. We can keep the parking requirement on the books, but give people exemptions or variances in exchange for thinking through other transit options. That's, I think that's very clever. I guess what I'm trying to think about is if I'm the developer and I'm just trying to pull one over, um, is this codified because the developer can sell a couple of years after the project is built? And a lot of developers do. That's a really normal practice. You build something, right. you pay back your investors, you get out with, with some profit, and you make it somebody else's management problem or situation. If they transfer this property and sell this property in a few years, does codifying this into the legislation make that requirement stick to the new owner because it's 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 in the because it's in legislation through the chair to the councilman? So that is why we codified it so that it it will be in this legislation is in perpetuity no matter who the owner is. Mm -hmm. So they would have to follow the transit demand management strategies. Um, it is not new to us that developers build projects and then they lease it up owning so that um, if they try to change the site plan, say maybe in six months from now, they go to building and housing and they change the site plan, uh, the old zoning will be reverted. So it'll go back to local retail um, C3, I think is what that says. It, and then the parking requirements will go back to one for one. Okay, because it's terribly interesting, Mr. Chairman, because mm -hmm. I hear a lot of developers say that the parking requirements actually hamstring them on a lot of development because they can't make full use of the of the of the property, property. because they have to keep so much yeah. reserved for parking. So this seems like a really good way to give developers more options to use land more creatively if they don't have to dedicate so much of that right. land to parking. In exchange, we're we're thinking long term about public transportation. So this sounds like a win win. I mean, it sounds like a really great um, you know proposal yeah. and project. From from the way I'm looking at it. Oh yeah, I agree. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Chair. We we hope to expeditiously bring more information on how something like this might be structured more permanently and securely soon. So mm. we'll we'll certainly be in touch. It's something we saw an opportunity with this specific project again to test it out to see what the appetite might be. And I think so far, at least in, in this experience with this particular developer, they've been really receptive to Good. the options that we've laid out. Uh, particularly subsi the subsidizing of transit passes. We found that in other cities we've looked at that have similar policies, that that really increases, lowers barriers, and increase, lowers barriers to access and, and, and encourages more ridership, Absolutely. which is something that, that w certainly since the pandemic, RTA has really struggled with. And so right. this is hopefully one of, of many more things we hope to share with you soon. Thank you. You had something to add? Nothing? He nailed it. All right, thank you, Mrs. Leonard. Uh, so I uh, thank you for that, Mr. Moss, because I, my, my thought is to uh, bring uh, planning and zoning back just to, you know, do a, uh, a catch up, you know, with the committee to know what you all are working on and some of the thoughts that you have, including, you know, this piece that we, 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 we've uh, learned about today. All right. We'd love Councilman to. McCormick, then we go to Councilman Thank McCormick. you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just got a note from Councilman Griffin, Council President Griffin, who represents this area, saying he is in full support uh, of this legislation and this project. Just wanted to add that. Thank you. Councilwoman Spencer. Thanks, Mr. Chair. A brief question through the chair, which is I've never heard of Acre uh, before as a developer. Do we know anything about where they're based, where they're from, who they are? I would love to give you that information. Do you have any information on Acre? No, they are just one of the partners in this development. The architect for this project was LDA. That's who I worked with um, mostly, uh, and Steve Jennings. Um, I worked with that team pretty much through this rezoning process after they went through planning commission. Their acre is one of their, I think, backers to the development um, that does have some type of, um, uh, they own some type of electrical charging um, company. I would, I can, try to find out some more information, I apologize. Sure. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just curious. I found um, online a website, acredevelop.com. I don't know if it's the same folks, but a lot of times I don't even tell you where they're based out of. I don't think these are Cleveland folks. Just, just curious. Uh, it's always interesting yeah. to know who's coming in. Thank you, Councilwoman. We, we will, uh, I'm sure Council President Griffin and Mr. Tytrick can get us some more information on who they are. All right, thank you. Any further questions from the committee? So no further questions, ordinance number 1193-2022 stands approved. All right, thank you, committee. If you can hang around, Council McCormick at once miscellaneous with the, uh, with the team here. I think they might be in Texas also. That's okay. just- um, Councilman. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a, a quick one for the team. Um, I'm just curious on the status of um, form-based zoning. So for folks that are not aware, it's essentially a, an ability, our current zoning code is, I think, horrible. Um, sorry, not your fault, <laughs> Shannon. It's the people in the 1920s' fault. Um, but form-based zoning essentially allows neighborhoods to craft and with the city zoning to kind of project what they want to see in the community and provides more clarity and things like that. So I'm just curious as to where we are on that. Yeah, thank you for asking. So uh, to give you an update, the form-based code is moving along. Uh, I intend to um, be meeting with you all soon, um, the various council folks that is in their wards uh, regarding the project. So the project started in 2019, as you know, with the consultant and then the pandemic hit, right? And so uh, then we had some, we had the administration change and then we had staff changes. Um, and so I have been put back in charge of the form-based code now that I've returned uh, with the city of Cleveland. And so what we did was a deep dive. We did an internal review and external review. We had about 16 developers or architects uh, that have specific uh, projects based on the zoning districts that have been crafted by the consultant to actually do a review of the form-based code and uh, the draft, uh, as well as doing a deep dive internally. Uh, so myself, Mr. Moss, and other staff members in the planning division, as well as Xavier, um, have done a, a, a full edit review. Um, and we have several edits to make to that draft. Um, and so we are working with the consultant to make those edits edits. There will be initial uh, review by the law department, uh, and then we are hoping to uh, start the education process, but at simultaneously uh, releasing the draft to the public for 30 days on our website, uh, and then doing, hopefully working with AIA and ULI to do a, like a weekend charrette where like the architects and designers of our city come together and here's the form-based code, design what you can with this, let us see how that will turn out. Uh, in the meantime, also doing uh, immense education with the communities, the CDCs, uh, and the council folks. And then after that, the law department will make any edits that need to happen. Uh, and then the law department will do a formal uh, review uh, internally, uh, and then we'll start the adoption phase. So though the uh, we would like to have it adopted by quarter one, I also understand that you guys have budget hearings in February and March. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So and um, I really appreciate that update. But the, so the city's goal is still overall to implement a citywide overhaul of the code. Is that correct? So the intention is to roll out the three pilot geographies, see how that goes, and then if it's, you know, understanding everybody seems to be on with it, the goal would be to definitely do um, an entire development ordinance okay. overwrite. Uh, and Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll finish by just saying, um, I'll, I'll give a quick example of why I think this is really important for our city. Matt Moss, um, in his previous life and current life, um, led a lot of the efforts around the Duck Island um, plan. And what that did is it put the community in charge with the city to say, here's what we want to see in the neighborhood. And then we passed for essentially a, a form of form-based zoning for the neighborhood so that even when there were certain folks that said, oh, you know, we don't want that here, we were able to say, well, you know, we had a full community process and the neighborhood voted on this. And, it, you know, so we were able to refer back to that community process. I know Councilman Santana's done a tremendous job on community planning, um, but it just was a really good way for transparency and clarity, community engagement to say, and for investors, provided clarity, right? So it just, it was, it's been really helpful in our community um, to engage the neighborhood and also to have predictability for everybody involved, neighborhood residents as well as investors. So I hope that um, we, we move forward with it. It's been really helpful in, in, the, in Ward 3. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you, uh, Council McCormick. Um, there's no other pieces to hear. Thank you for thank sticking you. around for miscellaneous. And yeah, you and I still need to get together on, uh, on a few items, all right? Perfect, thank you. All right, Madam Clerk, please excuse Councilwoman House from the zoning portion of the meeting. And the zoning portion of, meeting of this meeting is now over. And Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll for the general uh, DPS meeting? Garrison. Here. All right, Director, Director, uh, Director Wackers, can you please come on up? You do. It's on there. 
You know I emailed you about this. Okay. I'm still catching up on you. So. Okay. I think she's pulling up. Uh, I don't. In we didn't, we oh, okay. Didn't. All right. When I see you at the board, I, I, you know, I think that you're pulling something up. All right. Ordinance number 1037-2022 by council members Harrison and Griffin by departmental request. An emergency ordinance to amend the 10th whereas clause, the title and sections 1 and 3 of ordinance number 1123-2021 passed December 6, 2021 and to supplement the ordinance by adding new sections 1A, 1B, and 1C related to the development of 9410 Huff Avenue. Director Wackers, good morning. Good morning, Chairman and members of the committee. Um, we are here today to seek a, an amendment to a previously approved ordinance uh, back in uh, December 2021 for 9410 Huff. Uh, this is a, an affordable housing development project um, that we are now working toward uh, securing a contract for. Um, and as a result, law department has requested uh, some uh, amendments in order to facilitate that contracting. Uh, with me today, I have uh, Tony Bango, um, the Housing Development Office Manager, as well as Chris Shefton, uh, who is representing the developer um, uh, and is a part of um, the firm NRV. 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 Um, and with that, I think I'll have um, um, Tony Bango just uh, summarize the changes that law department has requested. Mr. Bango. Thank you very much, Assistant Director. Uh, Chair, so um, when this legislation was originally passed, it was uh, passed with, uh, the, at the time, the interim final rule from the Department of Treasury. Um, when we passed it, we believed at that moment in time that the end user and recipient of this loan had to be a nonprofit and that the loan term could only be short. Since then, the Department, the U.S. Department of Treasury has passed a final rule clarifying that the end user of the loan can indeed be a for-profit entity and that the loan term can um, extend up to 20 years. So in this amendment, um, it is authorizing us to begin the process and enter into an agreement with the developer to loan $8 million at a loan term of 20 years to a for-profit development entity, which is 9410 Huff GP LLC. Ooh. Thank you, Mr. Bango. Anything further? And uh, just to reiterate, uh, this is uh, not a change to the overall development. This is a request uh, in order to uh, be able to contract for the purposes uh, that the Council approved back in December of 2021. Thank you, uh, Assistant Director, Mr. Bango. Um, what were the current, what were the previous uh, uh, terms of up to 8 million for how long when it was initially uh, drafted? I believe when it was, right now, we um, have begun the process of drafting a current contract for this. Um, Originally, I thought it was believed that the loan term had to be a two-year term. Um, now we're looking at a 20-year term for the loan and a 40-year term of affordability associated with the, the full uh, unit spread for this project. Okay. So initially, we're looking at two years, and now we're looking at 20 years. So we've added 18 more years onto the uh, to the so proposed Just repayment. to clarify, Chair, um, so the two-year was not a... Um, was a restriction in place by the federal government on how ARPA funds could be used. Um, subsequent to uh, the interim ruling, they've come out with final uh, regulations for ARPA funding, and the final regulations allow for a loan of, of 20 years, um, which is really standard for housing development projects, and we're looking to really just apply what is standard. Um, the previous arrangement was a two-year loan followed with a a grant and, a, and a, with conditions for the performance of the project. Uh, the city would prefer to have a loan under the arrangement for a couple of reasons is that it gives us a greater standing and interest in the property to ensure that it is viable and maintained. Uh, but more importantly, um, it also op 
provides the opportunity for the developer to secure uh, other resources and use that loan um, uh, in, in getting tax credits for the project. So it, it overall, it's a benefit um, to the city and, and the project's success. Sure. Uh, thank you for that. I was going to ask you, what is, what, what is the typical uh, loan period that we, that we require or we, we, we contract for something similar to this? Uh, Chair, a uh, typical loan for something like this is anywhere between a 15 and a 40 year loan term. Mm -hmm. um, a 20 year loan term with this, with cash flow based repayment, is pretty normal for the Department of Community Development and uh, the Housing Development Office. Sure, thank you. Uh, and the requirement is for this to be, uh, what was the 40 year uh, affordable affordability? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Um, questions from the committee? Mr. Yes, Ms. McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Chair to the director, who, who is 9410 Huff GP LLC? Uh, I'll actually, uh, in order to answer that, Councilman, I'll hand that over to Chris Shefton so she can lay out the structure of the yep. development team. Good morning, um, Chair and Committee, uh, Councilman McCormick. Uh, so specifically, it's a LLC created um, for the partnership of the project. It's a general partnership um, as required by low-income housing tax credits. The members of that general partnership include um, our organization, Northern Real Estate Urban Ventures, as well as Sullivan Land Services um, Company as well. So those are the two members of the general partnership. Okay, thank you. So, Chair uh, to the team, the uh, initial developer that came before us last year, is she still involved in the project? Absolutely. That's okay. what I work for. That's, yeah. oh, I see. I'm sorry. Okay. No <laughs> yes. Forgot about that change. All yes. right. Um, so, okay. So, this is the, um, okay. I'm just trying to get my head around this. And just to clarify, as you're looking, um, uh, Gina, uh, the person who presented last December, she's actually down in Columbus. Chris actually drove up here uh, from Columbus because there's a big affordable housing conference um, mm -hmm. that happens every year um, that she is at. Otherwise, she would certainly be here. Um, but she sent her, her right-hand person in order to be I would be, here be there if I didn't have to be here. <laughs> yes. you know, I wanted to go, but <laughs> yeah. Yes. yeah. Uh, okay, no further questions, Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, and, let me, and you said uh, through the, uh, not through the, nobody, but uh, I know. So, uh, uh, Assistant, Director Wack, Assistant Director Wackers, I, that's why I just call you Director. <laughs> Director Wackers and uh, Ms. Shefton, you said that the, uh, okay, his phone is going off, that the uh, partnership is with Ms. Merritt and what was the other entity? SLS Co. Sullivan Land Services. Sullivan um, Land Services. Yes. Okay. They are the general contractor um, on the project and will be a partner as well on the project as well. So they're the general contractor and uh, the partner. Is this? What is the um, the, uh, the 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 percentage makeup between the Northern two? Northern Real Estate is the fifty-one percent owner in the project. Fifty-one percent, and then they're the forty-nine. Okay. All right. Any further questions uh, from the committee? Councilman Harsh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm very, very, very interested in this project um, because I think it's going to come up a lot in the next year. Um, just to, from my understanding, um, do we normally, Mr. Chair, uh, put the LLC name directly into the legislation? Director Wagner. Through, through the chair, through the yeah. director. Uh, through the chair to the councilperson. So normally we fund a program. So our gap housing um, uh, program, you guys allocate funding to that every year. Mm -hmm. um, and, we, and then we performed, a, that authorizes us to enter into contracts. So the legislation that typically never contemplates a specific project. ARPA is different. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So. Uh, as you know, we've done a number of projects with ARPA. Vesta did a uh, uh, did a proposal that received one or two million. Um, Sheila Wright's uh, firm received a proposal. Allen Estates um, also received like four million grant, I believe. Those had the LLC or the the owner included in the legislation. Um, that is partly a purpose uh, under the law department that the ARPA is different and we need to show uh, Where the qualifications of the projects. They felt that this was uh, an important okay. uh, departure from our normal practice. 
Okay. Um, and then through the chair to the director. Um, so this is also uh, a project that's seeking LIHTC funding. And would that be the 4% or 9%? 4%. 4%. Um, and uh, through the chair, if that LIHTC funding is not secured, uh, how feasible is this project? The reason for um, so going with 4% um, is that it's on a rolling basis. So that's number one, meaning you have more than one bite at the apple. Um, we've already been approved for our 4% LIHTC bonds, so we're good. Um, and staying again, staying away from 9% was exactly for that reason, so we would not have to go through a competitive process and be subject to having to reapply multiple times. Okay, so through the chair, the 4% is already given? Yes, they've been okay. secured. Um, Last question, uh, what is, through the chair, well not last question, through the chair, what is the, the affordability metric? Um, it's what percent of AMI, what percentage of, uh, percentage, what, what is the it's breakdown? It's 60% of AMI. Um, the whole, the entire building? The entire or? building is 60% of AMI. And what does that break down to for monthly rents? I don't know what the AMI, is that uh, county AMI or what, what will the monthly rents be? Um, somewhere between, um, I'm doing this from the top of my head, one bedroom at thank you. Um, one bedrooms are nine fifty one, and um, our two bedrooms will be eleven forty one. One thousand one hundred forty. Okay. Um, and then through the chair, I believe that. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is construction gap financing is basically what we're, we're calling this, construction gap. Um, and so, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think the construction gap is going to be needed for a lot of projects because I think there's a lot. Uh, the construction costs have just exploded in the last two, three years. Um, even, you know, when ARPA was coming out, I don't think a lot of us anticipated how much the costs were going to go up. Yeah. Um, that 20% turned into 25% and it went industry-wide, so it really touched every single aspect of a project. Um, Labor is going up. Everything is going up. So I think there is good argument for construction gap financing. I think it's very essential, and I think that when we have an opportunity to grow our city and to develop projects that bring bodies into the city and provide housing for people in the city, that we should we should pursue those projects. And um, was this the rehabilitation of a building that is vacant? So uh, the structure is a ten-story building at the corner of Huff and Ansel. The mm -hmm. Building has been vacant for thirteen years. Um, it needed to be an affordable project because it had HUD covenants on it, mm -hmm. and so um, our team was brought in to help. Um, SLS redevelop and finance the project. Okay. Uh, well, Mr. Chair, I think projects like this are very important, and it might be um, exotic uh, because it's uh, using ARPA funding, and it's a little bit unusual, I think, for what we're what we're used to. But I think it's really important that projects like this move forward. So, thank you. Sure. Thank you, uh, Councilman Harsh. Any other further questions from the committee? No other questions. Councilwoman, anything? Okay. Um, thank you, Councilman Hart. So yes, I mean, there's a real need for construction gap financing all across the city. And I think this $8 million has uh, set, the, set the standard uh, by providing $8 million to this project. And so I'm sure, well, we know, you know, that folks are watching, folks are, 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 are you know, uh, coming forward and asking, you know, for similar or if not more to what is being provided to this project and other projects. So uh, seeing no further questions from the committee, ordinance number 1037-2022 stands approved. All right. Thank you all. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Madam Clerk, yes. We're done. Yep. Okay. Um, Madam Clerk, please excuse Councilwoman House uh, from the meeting. And this meeting is adjourned. That's what I'm telling you, we're done.